How do we interpret the world around us? Do we really trust what we see? In this series, experience visual and audio illusions, sensory puzzles, and brain tricks from the worlds of art, science, nature, and psychology, and learn why they baffle our senses. Let's explore how our mind works. Puppeteers use strings to control their movements. We, on the other hand, are manipulated by the brain. The brain is the center of the nervous system of almost all vertebrate and invertebrate animals. In a human being's brain, the cerebral cortex has about 15 to 33 billion neurons. These neurons communicate with each other through protoplasmic fibers called axons. They send signal pulses called action potentials to different parts of the brain and body. The brain is in charge of controlling all the organs in the body. It generates patterns of muscle activity and promotes secretion of chemicals called hormones. This central control is what enables a quick and coordinated response to changes in the environment. Some examples are how reflexes are controlled by the spinal cord or peripheral ganglia. The brain is also in charge of our motor systems, meaning our body movements. This includes activating muscles, all the voluntary muscles in our body are directly controlled by motor neurons in the spinal cord and hindbrain. The spinal motor neurons are controlled by neural circuits and input from the brain. These neural circuits are responsible for many reflex responses, as well as rhythmic movements like walking or swimming. Descending connections from the brain allow more sophisticated control, which makes us different from robots. There are many motor areas in the brain that project to the spinal cord. Found at the lowest level are motor areas in the medulla and pons, which are responsible for stereotype movements like walking, breathing, and swallowing. Then, at a higher level, areas like the red nucleus are responsible for coordinating the movements of the arms and legs. At an even higher level, there is the primary motor cortex, which is a strip of tissue found at the posterior edge of the frontal lobe. This sends projections to the subcortical motor areas and also sends messages to the spinal cord through the pyramidal tract. This allows precise voluntary control of fine details of movement, like certain mannerisms or gestures. There are two types of motor neurons in the spine. There are alpha and gamma motor neurons. Alpha motor neurons stimulate muscle fibers responsible for force production. Gamma motor neurons stimulate fibers within the muscle spindle, which measures the length or stretch of a muscle. The Golgi tendon is also a stretch receptor, and this is found in the tendons that connect the muscles to the skeleton. It gives information about the force of muscle concentration to motor centers. The information from muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and other sensory organs are directed to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is involved in timings and coordination of motor programs, like when we learn new dance steps or a musical instrument. Actual motor programs are generated with a basal ganglia, which are involved in organizing motor programs for complex movements. Fact. The adult brain can effectively focus and concentrate for up to 25 minutes. Do you remember the first time you rode a bike, strummed a guitar, or learned to type without looking at the keyboard? At first, you didn't know what you were doing. But over time, and after much practice, you got more and more familiar with it. Until one day, you eventually learned to do it without even having to think about it. It just becomes something you can naturally do. This is something that is referred to as muscle memory. Muscle memory is not something that happens in the muscles. Muscle memory is something that happens in our brain. The first time you learn something new, the activity has not yet been programmed in the brain. This means your neural pathways do not know it yet, so they cannot enable the activity. However, your brain coordinates the different perceptual, cognitive, and physical signals that are needed to do the activity. This needs a lot of concentration. So your brain works extra hard to put this all together. So even if you can do this, it will feel a bit awkward in the beginning. When you eventually repeat the activity several times, neurotransmitter chemicals stimulate the brain cells that are related to grow dendrites. These are filaments on the brain cells, and they reach out and connect with other connected brain cells. 
When an activity has been repeated a certain number of times, or at least enough for the brain to remember, the brain cells connect in a circuitry of brain cells. This is called the neural pathway. It will need a lot of repetition for the memory of an activity to grow and connect to the neural pathway, and a lot of time to establish itself. Yet as soon as it is connected, the brain is programmed with a simple but effective circuitry that makes the activity doable and possible. So the brain no longer struggles to make it happen. It then eventually feels easy, as if it were second nature. What's more is that the neural pathway becomes a physical part of your brain, so it won't go away. You won't be able to forget that skill you learned even if you wanted to. So riding a bike, playing a guitar, or typing without looking at the keys is something you can do even while you do other things. It's not something you have to relearn, which is why it's called muscle memory. Two types of motor skills are involved in muscle memory, fine and gross. Fine motor skills are small skills that we perform with our hands, like brushing our teeth, writing with a pencil, or playing video games. Gross motor skills are actions that require the use of large body parts and large body movements. Some examples of these are sports activities like bowling, baseball, golfing, and swimming. When we keep reinforcing these movements day after day, the neural system learns both those fine and gross motor skills to the point that it becomes almost automatic. Fact, the brain loves questions. When you have questions in class or reading, the brain automatically searches for answers, making the learning faster. Have you heard the saying, a healthy mind means a healthy body? Do you believe it? Is it possible to affect the condition of our brains by making sure our bodies are in top shape too? When we live longer, there is a great chance that we can get age-related memory loss and dementia. According to research, the risk of cognitive problems is inherited. Fortunately, there is also evidence that maintaining a healthy lifestyle can help keep the mind active even in old age. Keeping physically active can keep our heart, lungs, and blood vessels healthy. This also ensures that all parts of the body, including the brain cells, get the oxygen and nutrients they need. If blood supply is impaired to the brain, it will not function as well. A healthy circulatory system is also important for a healthy mind. The brain uses 25% of the energy we consume. So keeping a healthy cardiovascular system to deliver that energy is very important. Keeping our muscles fit also helps our minds become healthier. A study of 900 seniors showed that those who maintained muscle strength were less likely to develop memory impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Challenging our mind also helps keep our brain and the informational processing in good shape. It can also reshape brain circuitry. We can challenge our brain by learning new things like a new language, reading, or playing a musical instrument. What we eat also plays a role in the health of our brain. Antioxidants with vitamins A, C, and E can slow down age-related decline of brain functions. So make sure you load up on foods high in antioxidants, like blueberries and walnuts. The risk of our brain's health is something that can also happen at a young age, when we do not have a healthy lifestyle. When we have negative emotions, such as anger, fear, sadness, or disgust, we are not just emotionally distressed. As a result of this, we get physically distressed as well. The good news is, we have the power to change these negative thoughts and turn them into more positive, rational, and motivating thoughts so we can create a healthy mind and body. More than 4,000 years ago, Physicians in China noticed that being ill followed periods of frustration in patients' lives. Studies have shown that emotions, life events, and coping skills have a very strong influence in our health. The focus on the healthy body-mind connection is now part of fields such as psychoneuroimmunology and behavioral cardiology. Stress hardiness is an overall approach to life that helps buffer the impact of stress and improve coping. When we keep attitudes, feelings, and behaviors that can help keep our body and minds healthy, we can ensure an overall sense of well-being and sharpness. Fact, the brain needs to be rested to learn faster and remember best. So, if you're tired, better take a quick nap first.
Earlier, we discussed the concept of muscle memory. This is the reason why we can do skills easier and better over time. But is there a way to consciously build muscle memory? Notice how professional tennis players, basketball players, and other athletes are able to serve, shoot, or hit their goals almost instantaneously? On top of having intense focus, they are also using motor learning or muscle memory. This is what will teach their muscles how to do the technique that works over and over. Theories on motor learning were developed during the start of the 20th century. One of the pioneers who studied it was Dr. Edward Thorndike, and he conducted different experiments that showed subjects needed minimal training to compete tasks they already learned in the past. We all have different muscle memory techniques, and we use them in our everyday lives. It takes a lot of practice and repetition for a task to be completed on just a subconscious level. For professional athletes, though, it takes hundreds of hours of practice and repeated shots for the brain and muscles to perform at a superior level. Adding specific motor movements to the brain's memory can take either a short or long time. It all depends on the type of movements being performed. When movements are just starting to be learned, the muscles and other body controlling features like the ligaments and tendons are still stiff and slow. They can easily be disrupted if the brain is not completely focused on the movement. To complete the process of memorization, acts have to be done with full attention. The reason is because brain activity increases when performing movements, and this increased brain activity has to be fully centered on the physical activity being completed. A lot of our motor learning happens at the cerebellum, the part of the brain that controls sensory and cognitive functions. When the brain memorizes the actions, the muscles have to be trained to act in a quick and fluid manner. For athletes, this can be done with strength training exercises because they enhance the synapse in the muscles that increase the speed impulses travel from the brain through the nervous system to the muscles. This lowers the time in between when the brain decides to complete a movement to when the muscles start acting on it. When the perfect technique is carried out, the brain will memorize what it feels like and will use the timing of the improved synapses to repeat the action again in the future. When you keep practicing your muscles, you will naturally hit poor shots once in a while. This is why a good attitude is essential. If you are easily affected by these missed shots, you will focus on them because bad shots are more emotionally charged than good shots. Your brain has to look past this and focus on what you are doing right on your great shots instead. If you do this, the brain and muscles will be able to memorize what it feels like and eventually you will be able to perfect the act. Fact. If your body is slouched down, it sends a message to the brain that what you are doing is not important, so it doesn't pay as close attention. In connection with how we achieve muscle memory, we have to realize that a good attitude combined with rep with a combination of both physical and mental practice, we can be able to perform at very high levels even during chaotic situations. Our brain, which is sometimes called gray matter, also has white matter that fills up 50% of our brain. This white matter is called myelin. It is a fatty tissue that covers the long axons and extends out of our neurons. Research has shown that myelination increases the speed and strength of the nerve impulses by forcing the electrical charge to jump across the myelin sheath to the next open spot on the axon. When we practice an activity, we trigger a pattern of electrical signals through our neurons. Over time, this triggers the glial cell duo to myelinate those axons, which means the speed and strength of the signal is increased. In other words, Myelin shows how practice is important in building muscle memory. However, it is not only the quantity of practice that is important in improving the skill, but also the quality of practice. Practicing skills over time lets our neural pathways work better in unison through myelination. So remember, the saying is indeed true, and it applies in nearly everything we do. Practice makes perfect. Fact. Your brain prefers spacious areas when learning. Don't study in a small, cramped area because it might affect your studying. It's always fun to learn something new, whether it's a musical instrument, language, or skill. Gaining new knowledge will always be beneficial to you. 
It can make you happier, increase your social circle, or even help you become a better person. Every time we learn something new, our brain changes in a substantial way. It also helps improve our working memory and verbal intelligence and increase our language skills. However, learning new skills is not always as easy as we would wish. But over time, the skill gets easier to do. Training results in decreased activity in brain regions involved in effortful control and attention. The more familiar you become with a skill, the less work your brain has to do. Over time, the skill becomes automatic because the brain strengthens itself as well as you learn the skill. There are many different events that can increase a synapse's strength when we learn new skills. This is called long-term potentiation. When this happens, repeatedly stimulating two neurons at the same time strengthens the link between them. The more connections between neurons are formed, the more we learn and the more information we can store. When we learn something new, sometimes it gets tempting to try to learn so much at once or obsessively work on it. This isn't the best idea though. Instead, spreading out the learning process, which is called distributed practice, is a better way to learn. Distributed practice is an old technique, but it works well considering we also do so much in a day. So instead of allotting hours at a time to learn a skill, distributed practice makes use of shorter, smaller sessions where you stimulate the link between neurons more often over time. Experiential learning is the best way to learn because the more you apply what you are learning every day, the more it will stick in your head. When you learn by doing, you implement everything that makes your memory work. So you connect what you're learning with a real world task that forms the bonds in your brain, making the skills stick in your memory. For example, when learning a musical instrument, deliberate practice makes you more mindful of what you are doing right and wrong, so you know where to improve. Deliberate practice makes you track what you are learning, focusing on short learning lessons and practicing smart, but not hard. We can learn best when we have context. This applies to new skills and also to some random things we learn in school. The transfer of learning is helpful when you're learning a new skill. It allows you to apply your new skills in your day-to-day -day life in a context that you can relate to and are familiar with. So if you are learning about mathematics, you have to find a way to relate that into your everyday life. For example, you can use computation while shopping or checking out how much gas you need in your car. These may be simple applications, but they form connections in your brain that will definitely matter. Fact, the brain loves color. To help you remember, use good quality pens or even colored paper. It will be a lot more fun too. According to researchers, memory is a process. When we remember, we are reconstructing the event from bits of information stored in different parts of the brain. By learning more about our brain's chemical makeup, we become aware of what we can do to be more in control of it. Here are some characteristics of memory we should take note of. Sensory is when we remember things using our five senses. The more our senses get activated, the easier it will be to recall. Intensity is when something really stands out from our memories. This can be something crazy or extreme. Outstanding is when things that are dull and unoriginal are more difficult to remember because nothing distinguishes them from other memories. Emotional is when the amygdala, the round pea-sized part in the middle of our brain, acts as a gatekeeper and stores memories with high emotional content. This way, we tend to remember more easily. Survival is when anything we perceive as important to survival is easier to remember. This can include physical, emotional, psychological, and even financial survival. Personal importance is when we naturally remember things that specifically interest us and have a specific significance to us. Repetition is when the more often we remember information, the better we get at recalling them on demand. First and last is when the brain easily recalls things from the beginning and ending of any session or lecture. So you better pay attention to remember what happens in between. In fact, that is one of the things we will discuss under the keys to memory. First is paying attention. Sometimes, the biggest problem is how people's minds aren't focused in the moment. Instead, they are thinking about something that happened in the past or something they want to do in the future. 
Visualization is another key to memory. You can do this by creating a visual in your mind because the brain remembers in pictures and concepts, not words. Association is one more way to hone your memory. You can do it by finding something to connect the information to or a similar word that reminds you of it. Lastly, you can use your imagination. Feel free to get creative when visualizing or using ideas to associate memories. We sometimes forget things because they were never stored properly in the first place. Perhaps there was something lacking in terms of emotional or personal importance connected to the information to make it stick to our minds. Another possibility is that it was emotionally traumatic and the mind suppressed it to maintain normalcy. We tend to remember negative events though because whenever strong emotions are activated, the information experience is embedded into our memory. Remembering things and putting them into actions can sometimes be a chore. Sometimes though, we learn things as a result of habit, like the directions going to school or work. Even if we do not pay attention to where we are going, we somehow get to where we want to go. There are times though when it is difficult to remember things. For instance, how come it is so easy to memorize a song we love compared to a page of a history book? We have learned how information is stored in our brains why we remember some things compared to others, and how we can improve them to benefit us in the best possible way. So, don't forget everything you learned, okay?